27, 2019, I would like to open the regular Foxborough School Committee meeting at the, in the Foxborough High School Media Center. And my first wish is welcome after whatever holiday you celebrated and may 2019 be special to each person. Uh, Mrs. Weiss is unable to be with us this evening and we will not see our selves on the monitor tonight, but I have been assured that this is being broadcast. So we will be heard at home for those of you wishing to follow our budget discussion and our capital improvement plan. On the agenda are visitors, approval of minutes, teaching and learning highlight, girls who code, Mr. Dan Ambrosio, FY 20 budget continued discussion, Dr. Amy Berdos and Mr. Bill Yukna. Discussion of FY20 capital improvement plan draft, Mr. Bill Yukna. At 8.30, we will have acceptance of donations. Meditech, which is Medical Information Technology, Inc., and Partners in Patriotism. From there, we will move on to other matters before adjournment. Do we have any visitors? All right, approval of minutes. Oh, I guess our first approval of, min of minutes would be the draft for the budget subcommittee meeting held on December 12. I didn't have any changes. Any changes? <laughs> no, I'm not there, so I was going to move to approve. Okay. <laughs> I'll second that. Thank you. All in favor? Four zero zero. Thank you. And for our regular December 17 meeting of 2018. I had no changes to this meeting. Neither did I. I would move to approve the December 17th minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Abstain. One of, okay, three yes, uh, one abstention. Thank you. And now, teaching and learning highlights. Girls who can code. Would you like to introduce this, you know, please? I'm going to let Dr. Mello oh, introduce. Dr. Mello introduce. Yes. So very I'm well. Very excited to welcome Mr. Dan Ambrosio. If you want to come up to the table, Dan. Dan is our middle school tech integration specialist. So in his role, he works with teachers and students to more authentically incorporate technology into our instruction. And he is a... Um, someone who has a lot of fans at the middle school, both teachers and students alike. And he's really interested in getting kids excited about technology, and he had this idea to implement this new club that he started called Girls Who Code. And so we invited him here tonight. He has, it hasn't started yet, but he's here to tell us what is in the works for the Ahern Middle School. So welcome, Mr. Ambrosio. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for having me tonight. Um, this all kind of started over the summer. I went to a week-long trading um, from a computer science company called Code.org. Um, they're a provider of a, a, a lot of curriculum for the state for computer science. Um, and there I was able to learn a little bit more about um, some computer programmers and their experiences, especially women um, in the technology industry. Um, and then I took that curriculum and came back to the Ahern and piloted some of it with uh, a sixth grade classroom. Um, and I kind of heard whispers about Girls Who Code. There was this you know, discussion over the summer about what it was and how great it was. Uh, but it wasn't r really until I got back to the classroom and I was able to work with some students where I saw girls um, actually kind of light up um, when they started doing some of the programming and the coding work. Um, so I decided to register the Ahern um, as an official uh, Girls Who Code club. Um, so instead of me just explaining what it is and what it's all about, um, for those of you that know me, know that I love video, so I put <laughs> a little something together. Um, the first piece of it is just going to address, as you can see, the issue um, and the problem. And so the whole mission around Girls Who Code um, is trying to um, close the gender gap um, in technology. Um, so the first piece of this is a trailer for a movie that does a great job of showing what that issue is and kind of describing a little bit. Um, the second piece is just um, is the founder of Girls Who Code, um, Reshna Sajani, 
Um, she talks about her mission and kind of where the club came from. And the last piece is just hearing from um, some girls who actually took part, not in the, the club, uh, but in their summer Im immersion program, which I can speak to um, after it. Are you going to wireless mouse me? Yeah, I saw you moving it. Go ahead. <laughs> wireless <laughs> mouse me. Yeah. There will be 1.4 million jobs by 2020 in the computing related field. Less than 29% of them are going to be filled by Americans, and less than 3% of that 29% are going to be women. I don't think software engineering is a meritocracy. Being excellent or being good at your job isn't enough if you're a woman, in fact. The sort of phenomenon of the programmer has really interested me. Programmer. 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 It's hard to encourage more women to come into an environment that will sexually harass them and not fund them. As soon as a woman gets introduced, it's like blood in the water. When companies started putting these full diversity disclosure reports out there, it became very obvious, wow, there really is a problem. This is something that we need to be trying to address. Women were the pioneer programmers. They've been written out of history, unfortunately. Grace Hopper came up with the concept of real programming languages. Ha, uh, coding's magic. I like coding because instead of us same way that everyone should know a little bit about law and everyone should know a little bit about economics, you probably should know a little bit about computer science. Growing up, I was actually a, a system kid. I didn't know that I could learn how to code like so quickly. The reason that there's a gap is actually related to some really real structural factors. Girls aren't encouraged to pursue computer science. They're overlooked because, you know, the boys that are good at science and the boys that are taking apart computers at age nine. Most students have no exposure to programming. Computer science should be a requirement in all public schools. This is a Rosie the Riveter moment because the jobs are here and we don't have the workers to fill them. For the digital revolution mm. to truly be great, it can't just be for a certain set of people. I'm hopeful because I think that the tech industry could move the fastest. If we see the problem, we can debug it. This is our country, our cities, our communities, our children, our code. Mm. The gender gap. <laughs> so it's a full-length documentary if you mm -hmm. if you want to check it out. My name is Rashma Sajani, and I'm the CEO and founder of Girls Who Code. I went to all the right schools. Straight A student. I went to work what I thought was all the right firms, and I was miserable. I wasn't doing what I felt like I was put on this earth to do. And so I quit, and I ran for Congress. It was the best experience of my life because it taught me how to be brave. I saw that far too many girls weren't going to have a shot to march up into the middle class. And that's why I started Girls Who Code because I wanted to make sure that they had control over their own economic future. I brought our friend's conference room, I handpicked my first 20 girls, and it was in that first like moment of our first class, I'm like, wow, this is something. One of the good things about being a field politician is I've had lots of experience of raising money and convincing people to invest in me when the, the outcome is bleak. Six years later, I've never stopped asking for investment in this amazing idea in this movement. We've reached over 40,000 girls in all 50 states. We're marching towards 100,000. We run 80 summer immersion programs in 11 cities. When I look at the rates of our girls that are going into this field, we can do this. We have to do this. The girls. I wanted to be a part of Girls Who Code because it was an opportunity for me to try something new. Well, I've always been looking for coding experience. It's really hard to find like classes in my schools that have any clubs. At first, it's kind of intimidating, and you feel like you're not going to get through it, and you don't know really how. It gave me the confidence to believe that I can learn this sort of thing, and I thought that it would be really hard. It's become really easy to learn these things, and I think that's really cool. I personally really enjoy 2048, just because you sit there, and you play the game on your phone, and you're like, this must have been so hard to code, and like you're having a great time, but, you know, I, I did it. We did it. We, we can do that stuff. We reach this moment where it clicked and then you get there and it's really great and it's one of the best feelings I've ever had.
also we get to like bond with each other like even more sisterhood yeah, yeah it's been like really cool watching everyone become yeah. so close she had a lot of interest in the same things that i was interested in we're both coming up with different ways to like redefine what our project can be and it's so great to have someone else who's also coming up with ideas i think it's so important that we girls have girls to code for us because computer science field really could use women in technology and seeing how much like I like it, how everyone else in the program likes it, just makes me think about how many other girls we can impact with programs like Girls Who Code. So we have a summer program, we call it our summer immersion program, where we put girls, 20 girls at a time, in a technology company, and they learn the fundamentals of computer science. They learn, you know, coding languages, they learn how to build a mobile app, how to build a website. The last two weeks they actually have their own projects, so where they design or create something, whether it's an algorithm or whether it's an app. So as far as I'm concerned, we run the internet. You know, women Facebook more, they tweet more, they make 85% of all consumer purchases. I think our world is just going to be a better place with more female engineers and software programmers. We should be sitting on the other side. Hmm. So the Girls Who Club, um, the actual club, there's a, a third grade through fifth grade, which I went ahead and registered. Um, this, the dif district four as well um, and then we'll be holding the six through eight middle school club um, starting next month and then I hope to expand um, beyond that in the future how many are enrolled right now uh, right now we actually just launched and started the registration and recruitment process so we only have six girls um, but I will say um, two of those girls were from the class that I piloted the original code.org curriculum in um, so I feel I feel good and I feel encouraged that we can we can get more students involved I think once they try it and talk about it, it'll it'll grow even yeah. farther from there. I was just going to say the same thing. Um, <clears throat> it said in the video that like every school should have computer science. Yeah. So moving on a little bit, what how, um, what percentage of the students have something like this uh, in, during the school year? Uh, right now. Yeah. Um, right now, the, the entire sixth grade um, will begin it. Right now, we're trying to implement it more at the middle school level, um, as well as the seventh and eighth grade. Um, should be should be getting um, code, are you talking specifically coding or computer, computer science? science? Yeah. So our APP tech class, our seventh and eighth grade class, um, is mainly in our business and technology education classes. Um, but we feel like we have pretty good coverage for five through eight in those two classes. Good. Um, Ideally, you, you get in, in everywhere. Um, you know, computer science isn't something that's limited to one subject. It really can be brought into any yeah. um, classroom. Um, but that's a shift for educators. Uh, so I think it's going to take some time. Yeah, in my class, we did the hour of code. Yep. Yeah. It was. Uh, they started out like you know, it was going to be something like lame, and they really got into it. Yeah, yeah, kids really get into it, and you only do it for an hour, and then you take it away, and then they just want to do more. Yeah. With, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, if, if you um, really get the ball rolling and get yeah. more than six girls interested, is this something that might carry over into our summer enrichment programs? Oh, it could, definitely could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely could. And um, since we're just rolling it out now, yeah. um, you know, it's hard to expand quickly. But I think especially um, at the end there, I wanted to show that summer immersion program, which is something that we could definitely tell our high school students about. It's mm -hmm. for um, it's designed for rising um, 10th and 11th grade students. Mm -hmm. So something that could easily get into. It's a big commitment, but um, I'm sure we have students who are probably already interested in it. I'm sure we have companies in this area who would probably be very excited yes, to definitely. participate as well. So, so yeah, um, hopefully you can help spread the word, um, get some interest going for the club. Are you the instructor, Mr. Ambrosio, for the club? Uh, myself, along with some other uh, female colleagues that I've recruited. Good. Yeah. And the three to five club. Are we running that this year? I would love to. Yeah, I'm working on it right now and getting um, some of the elementary schools involved and some That's other um, educators involved. That's great. With all the access our students have to technology and devices, I mean, I think it makes really great sense for them to apply their knowledge in a way that sort of out of the traditional classroom box and get them excited though as I was talking about project lead the way at our last uh, school committee meeting what we're trying to do is hook them younger and get them excited about mm -hmm. computer science and engineering and uh, biomedical science too for the project lead the way and this is a great step in that direction so thank you for bringing this to oh, us you're very welcome and, and uh, girls code actually have a platform for um, alumni um, to actually get them hired by companies so they create that pump line for those alumni to get hired by by companies so kids are building their resumes as they go yeah that's, that's exciting 
I think too, as Dan had mentioned, this came from a week-long course that he did during mm -hmm. the summer. And I think it's just a great example of our teachers who are constantly learning and looking at what they can bring back to our students. So thank you for that. My pleasure. That's great. Is the club after school? Is it, like after it will school? be after school, so yeah. Thank you and your colleagues for that as well. It takes, it takes extra time to do these things, so we appreciate the extra time for the kids. It's definitely worth it when you see the look on their face. Like and I'm sure so they exciting. appreciate yeah. it, too. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't happen without support of the administration. So thank you, Ms. Abrams, for coming and for yes. supporting the clubs. When we have new clubs, it's always exciting that teachers can propose new clubs. And there's so many different things that run at the Ahern. So that's part of it, probably, too, is that kids have a lot of other competing activities. But they do. I think this one will pick up steam, like you were saying. Your well, after so. school is beginning to be as busy as your school day. <laughs> so proud of it, yes. <laughs> so true. Do they give you supper breaks? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> well, this is good. Hopefully you can come back um, after the club starts. And yeah, I would love to. With the that girls. That would be great. With yeah. the girls, you yes. guys. Yeah, I yeah, would love to. Thank you. This is very exciting. I know, I mean, so this is my seventh year on the school committee, and I know I've had parents since year one for me talk about why don't we have more computer science classes, particularly at the younger levels, you know? And, and we've done a, a lot through the last few years to bolster right. where we're at. Yes. But this is another exciting step in the right direction. Yes. So, thank you. And I should say that Dan has really been instrumental in working with me to write the Project Lead the Way grant. Mm -hmm. Probably he's done more than me, actually, on the grant side. So. Um, it's been really great to partner with you to sort of bring these things to fruition because they have been on our minds for quite some time. It's just been finding the right fit, and this seems to be a great one. So, Well, I excited. think since we're having our budget discussion tonight, this is a perfect example of a position that has been added yes. to our budget that has benefited our students it, uh, exponentially. Uh, thank you. That's the yes. word I was looking for. I was going <laughs> to say tenfold, <laughs> and that was not the right word. Exponentially is definitely the right word. Leave it to the math uh, teacher to <laughs> pull that one out. But no, it really, truly, um, it's just an example of how having that tech integration specialist mm -hmm. at all levels right. and including them is just allowing us to give our students so many more opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. And our teachers, and our teachers as right. far as using the technology right. that we're going to talk about in our CIP Absolutely. request. So it's all coming together and we couldn't do it if we didn't have the support of our community in adding these positions Agreed. to our budget Absolutely. over the last few years. So we're really, I'm really grateful. Yeah, we're all very grateful. We are very grateful. Yes. Well, thank you so much for coming thank and sharing this with you. us. I appreciate thank you. it. Have a good evening. We look forward to seeing you and your ladies someday. Yes, yes. me too. <laughs> <laughs> On to FY budget continued discussion, Dr. Berdos and Mr. Yukon. Well, at the last school committee meeting, we gave a very lengthy presentation, um, and I think a synopsis of this, is, uh, of that message, really was that the goal is to maintain our current programming. It wasn't about adding any new initiatives or new programs. It was looking at what can we do to maintain the same level of educational um, services for the excellent education that we provide students. So, if um, the committee has questions based on the budget that was presented at the last meeting. I, I don't know if that's where you want to start first. The other thing is I did hand out <coughs> the analysis we did started last year, um, <coughs> obviously updated for the 2020 budget, but um, I'll review that too with you um, if, mm -hmm. if you'd like. Uh, but I think it, it shows, uh, again, um, where our, our money is spent in a large degree. It also, um, we did do the same update that we did last time on the major projects that are happening in town for um, you know, residential. Um, kind of give you an update on that as well and how that obviously could impact us. So, um, but which, whichever way you guys want to start. Do you have any of the, from the budget that we did from, you know, the last time we had our meeting or you're pretty clear with that. It was very explicit. One question that did come up, Tina brought it up, which was on the media center here, and that's the, the book, um, you know, text purchases. Um, that has morphed quite a bit over the years. As you can tell, our <coughs> libraries are no longer uh, the libraries of yesterday where there were just rows and rows of books. 
mostly because of the technology um, and the ability to get a lot of the stuff online at this point. So even though the budget really hasn't changed dollar-wise overall, what it has is it's morphed into the areas in which we spend the money, uh, most of it in the media side of things now for uh, the children that have the resources. We still obviously have a book budget, which allows us to, to keep our, our um, you know, our libraries up to the, the current, um, you know, standards of what's out there. But um, it's not as much done that way as it is done where more and more copies by doing it online are available to more kids than buying three for the, the bookshelf. So Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that is what I figured. It just, yeah. that was a, a particularly large reduction, yeah. which is a good thing. Um, and, th and that. You know, and it, I, just, I just thought we'd bring it yeah. to the attention. I think it's yeah. always good that we, the level of detail you and all of our administrators put into the budget um, is so uh, precise that you know you drill down to the last you know penny really yeah, on and, each and item. Right, and, and I think we tried as we've said over the last couple of years we've been really trying to make the budget reflect where the money is spent. Right. Uh, again, from a transparency point of view, putting it on one line, spending it on another doesn't really mm -hmm. uh, make sense. So. As things have changed, and obviously they change every year um, in the way we educate and what we, you know, what we need for resources, um, the budget also kind of morphs along with it. Um, so that's why you'll see in any given budget similar dollars, but allocated into different categories. Um, and again, that's to, to fill the same needs. Thanks, Bill. Why don't I take you through the, uh, the, the few sheets that I handed out? Um, that would be helpful. So. The first sheet, uh, page one, is basically a, uh, a tally of all of the uh, employees that we have. And these are kind of the, the broad scope um, categories that we look at um, our staffing in. And these are not FTEs. This is actually bodies. Um, so it's an important differential because you'll see when you try to match this up to the that one of the next slides out there with, with teachers that there's a lot less FTEs because we have a lot of people that are 0.4s, 0.6s, 0.8s um, in the mix depending on how we need them. Um, so you'll see that, you know, as the employer of the town, we are the largest um, employee base uh, with a total of 503. Um, there are two self-funded groups within that. One is the extended day, which um, is 21, um, and the cafeteria staff, which is about 22. They both, uh, both of them, either through tuitions or through um, lunch fees, basically fund their own uh, staffing um, as well as their own expenses. But they're still included in our numbers because obviously we manage them. The uh, <coughs> You know, in the other areas, you'll see again, um, as far as the administration size, that has not changed uh, in a number of years. Um, you know, we've been able to basically maintain our, our structure that way. Um, and we have moved, you know, around in our, in our teachers' uh, workforce based on the needs within the, the building. So as our populations have changed, the, the teacher count has changed. If you look at uh, page two, again, very yeah, similar. Can I, I just... I found this very interesting when I came in and asked you, and I don't know how many people are aware of it. You know, several years ago, you might just have after-school care for a while, but I was surprised when you told me the other day that society has changed so, and so many have dual parents working, that Mr. Eukna was able to tell me that there are full uh, extended day care at all three elementary schools that start at 6.30 in the morning and go until 6 o'clock at night. And I don't know if, a, I was unaware of that, even being on the committee, so I just thought that might be a nice well, um, I think thing it's a, for the public to know. Yeah, I think it's a great resource that the mm -hmm. community has. Obviously, there are other options in the community. Uh, the Y has some. There are some right. other smaller venues that, that you can go to, but for the parent who, um, you know, wants kind of like the one-stop shop where they, they can drop their child off, they know they're going to be in the right place to be to get their education when the time comes, um, they know when it's, when, you know, after school comes that they're again in that same safe environment and they can be picked up from that same location. Um, we obviously offer a very good program that, that manages that. I think we've got a 
great staff over the last uh, five years. We've done a lot of work with them, and they've done a lot of work uh, on their side as well as far as getting them educated and making sure they're certified um, to run those programs, which I, I think we thought was very critical uh, to having a successful program. Mm -hmm. um, but the extended day, as you said, you know, um, a lot of parents need to leave town early in the morning. 6.30 seems to work very well. Um, and and in the afternoon, uh, the uh, uh, Hearn also has that program. Um, they start obviously earlier in the morning, so that's why that isn't a morning session. But um, you know, they'll have their afternoon session, which will go to six o'clock as well. So it does give parents a, a very good option. We know competitively wise, price wise, we are less than the area opportunities that, that are similar to us, uh, and we do that strategically because again, all we have to do is cover all of our costs. Um, and the extended day also. Um, through its tuitions actually does put money back into our budget uh, lines like electrical cost, heating cost. Um, so they're actually funding some of that as well, which I think is kind of a, uh, you know, a nice uh, payback as well to the community. So it's, it's working for everybody. Um, I think it's been a, a, a very successful program and we are very fortunate to have um, the staff we have that um, many have been doing it for years. So I was just going to say that and to your point, I, there was a point, um, the Ahern After School program, the person, the main person who runs it, who had met with me as the curriculum director <clears throat> to get trained on some engineering programs from the Museum of Science so that she could engage with the students in the engineering stuff. I, I thought that was fantastic. I mean, it is, it's very, I think it is very, very exciting. That yeah. It also addresses, I mean, the need for that. Well, and it's a structured program. So mm -hmm. part of the thing right. in the afternoon is that they do it, they have a homework period. Mm -hmm. So again, the parents look at that as a, as a positive as thing. A positive. So by the time they come home, the kids have already spent some time with somebody helping them to try to, to work through their right. homework. Right, and they, another um, advantage so, that right. they see other children doing their homework, which right. is a exactly. nice motivation itself. Yeah, it's good I mean, when, the, when women had to go to work during the war, they had to have daycare centers open, and I was watching some an old documentary, and they referred to those daycare centers so that the women could work because the men were. Uh, they called them eight-hour orphans. <laughs> I'm sure some of those children in a nice structured environment with other little people to play with were having a lot more fun maybe than sometimes every day all day with mom. But it was such a surprise for me to hear the expression eight-hour orphan. <laughs> So that certainly isn't the case here with our 12-hour supervised educational It's a long day play. for the kids. It's a long day. Yeah, it's a positive. But it's in a positive yeah. environment. Page 2 gives you kind of a, a breakdown of what our um, core teaching uh, teachers are within each area. Um, obviously, when you look at something like fourth grade, that's 10 core teachers. That does not include your specials like your uh, music and art um, teachers because obviously you're, you're, those get broken down over time. But so you got you can see that our average classes really are still in the same range of anywhere from 17 to about uh, 21, 22. Um, that's not to say that we don't have classes in certain areas that might be 24 and 25 because of the uh, community breakdown. And we also have may we have some like in the AP on the high school. I know I've seen a few that, that are as low as 12, 13. Um, and again, that's when you try to have the level of offerings that, that we have, which I think um, parents and students appreciate, it, it does make your numbers uh, a difficult thing to try to just control to a single <clears throat> level. Is the pre-K size big because there's like a educational assistant in there? There's a number of educational assistants in there. That's there's actually six educational assistants for three classes. But there's uh, not 29 kids in a preschool no it's 29 class. it's 29 to the teacher it's yeah, not so 29 to the oh it's taft yes because yeah, they have okay. the different a.m p.m right. right, two days a week three days a week <laughs> yeah. um i thought that was the case too i was like wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no. could you imagine teaching yeah. oh, 29 preschool yeah, yeah, yeah. at the same time <laughs> so, so even with three educational assistants there is not oh, 29 any time in any one of the classes there might be eight Eight. You know, nine type of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a little deceiving the way that one looks. Um, you know, again, the teacher breakdown, this gives you kind of a little bit of a level of breakdown as far as the type of, of, of teaching, um, whether it's a core teacher or a health teacher, a music teacher, foreign language. Um, so you can see the numbers there, which have been staying fairly consistent um, as far as our, our, our base. Page three. Um, gives you a kind of a, a breakdown of the average salary um, for the entire district. So this is not just teachers. This, this is 
um, the entire district in. And so for FY20, we're projecting a, an average of about 74,000, um, which is up about 2.9% over um, last year's total. Again, that's greatly impacted by the fact that many of our uh, contracts have not only a COLA increase, but they have a step increase, and then some obviously on the teaching side have a, um, a lane increase based on education. So there are mul multiple in increases in there. So it's not just, if it were just the 2%, obviously, then this would just be 2%. Um, and there are many of our, our staff, as you're going to see, it's actually even grown higher than it was last year that are on top step. So all they are getting is the COLA. Mm -hmm. um, side of it so that's what controls uh, the average rate this also is subjected to that hundred twenty five thousand um, dollar effective give back that we have to find through retirements uh, at the end of each year so that's one of our other components in our salary budget that we deal with page four will give you a breakdown from FY 19 to FY 20 um, by these major categories and we break this down even a little further so you can see how guidance breaks down on the different levels. Um, the fact that we do have a college uh, ad admissions counselor and a, a school to career specialist um, under our special services with our occupational therapist, physical therapist, um, ELL, speech, phys um, psychiatrist, and social worker. Um, so you can see all the breakdowns. And the, the four items that are green, the first one is teachers. As you can see, we're decreasing our overall teacher base. Um, year over year um, and that's basically due to enrollments uh, on the elementary levels for the most part of it the uh, speech teacher we did have a slight bump last year which is reflecting now this year because it wasn't budgeted last year for for uh, point two um, the psychiatrist uh, psychiatrist psychologist uh, of a half a point increase that's the uh, team chair um, where it's going to sit right now it will be pulled out of there um, and be put into obviously a team chair uh, location mm -hmm. if it is approved and then the um, ed assistance as you can see we're up um, at this point just um, just under two per two point um, two FTEs because of uh, requirements throughout the district um, and I think that's kind of reflective so you see that we're, we've gone to up to uh, 426.15 FTEs um, which is only point one oh increase over last year um, and uh, you know again I think the most of the one of the biggest issues here even though the, the numbers are financially within the the picture here is we still have a um, teacher's contract an ed assistance contract a secretary's contract and a transportation contract to settle mm -hmm. uh, for this year within this budget so this budget also has to incorporate those and it does at this point I think the other piece too here where we're seeing those slight recommendations as far as next year it it's very much a budget that's focused on student needs yes um, I just wrote that down on <laughs> my, right there yeah. I, have, I have a question on the guidance yes um, I noticed the the high school has four elementary has three and a half Ahern has three mm -hmm. when's the last time that Ahern has had an increase in guidance in guidance has it been a while do you know, sir? Hmm. In the, uh, maybe around 2004 or five. Is that an issue with four grades and three guidance counselors in the middle schools? I think there's always a need. Um, it's a matter of when I'm we're looking at prioritizing <laughs> based on where those needs are. As an example, last year we had the 0.5 increase at the high school for a social worker. And, and the year before we did 0 0.5 for elementary, I Correct. Think. And the team chair that we're talking about is on the middle school level. Yeah. That would be um, additional yeah. support for oh, the middle so school. They're both? Yeah. Didn't okay. we add, though, social worker and, or some social work, part of a social worker and, and a psychologist at the middle school level within the last? Six years, maybe. I don't know. I don't so think since I've been I'm here, which is seven years. Not so. at the middle school. Not at the middle school level. I could be confused. So. Well, actually, yeah, about five five, five years, years ago. ago yeah. Um, our school psychologist That's became what um, yeah. full time. Point five. Okay. We had that point five position to support the teachers in helping mm -hmm. the students. Right. You know, during our meeting times to have you know 
more formalize the TAP team process, mm -hmm. as well as give the teachers tools for meeting the social emotional needs. Yeah. Um, and kind of codify those things because we did not have a team chair it kind of filled the gap a little bit that must be what I'm thinking of thank you so yeah that's exactly correct that yep. would be yeah I was just curious because I know um, obviously you can always add guidance counselors um, there's always going to be a need for them so I was just curious how long it had been it's a good question mm -hmm. <clears throat> Page five just kind of gives you an analysis of our grants and, and the changes uh, year over year. Um, so as you can see, from what we anticipated in FY19 to what we're anticipating in FY20, we're going to be down 121,000 in total. As we noted before, the biggest um, reduction to that is $100,000 that's no longer in the um, kindergarten tuition line. So minor tweaks on the other um, sides from at least what we can see so far. Um, this is one of those lines that, uh, you know, as we've said in the past, it actually doesn't even get, um, you know, applied for until, you know, through the end of the summer and beginning of, of, of the fall. So we don't really have a great handle of what we're going to have for money, um, but we hope that they at least continue to fund on the level they have in the past. And we've, we've had some surprises in the past. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and even though our Title I um, grant has come in a little bit lighter. We haven't pulled back on the events and the services that we provide through Title I. We just had our Helping Your Young Learners Succeed Night, and we, we funded it, even though it's not funded in the grant, because we want to make sure that parents still get that service as something that we've been providing. So, so we've been able to find that funding somewhere else? Exactly. Yeah, it's minimal, yeah. It, but it's still something that, you know, it'd be nice to have the grant, but it all depends on our how our socioeconomic mm -hmm. numbers come in each year. Mm -hmm. uh, page six is that analysis we showed you before. So this is really between FY19 and FY20, wh what changes actually occurred in the budget process. So, um, you know, as I said, a lot of these things happen. So after the FY19 budget was completed, uh, we came to the end of the school year. We started to see what our enrollments were going to change in certain areas, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of our needs were going to change as far as potentially IEPs or other um, you know, uh, student driven needs. We actually would change our staffing over the summertime um, and not fill positions that we had initially intended to fill, but then fill a different position to make sure that we could make the whole thing work. Obviously, with, with an IEP, we have um, statutory requirements, legal requirements that we have to meet. That's not an option. Um, so in a budget like this, you're always going to have to have that flexibility to move. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've been able to do that fairly successfully over the last you know, number of years. So, um, you know, when you look at it, we know we don't have the, the carte blanche to do anything we want because obviously still have to live within our budget. But um, you will get some FTE changes uh, from budget time to actual. Uh, when we when we hit the road in September 1st so when we at when we were at the Board of Selectmen for the the revenue overview um, back in November yep. yeah, November we had a discussion with the Board of Selectmen about how well we all are talking about level services that our services are changed to meet student needs and so do our full-time employee positions you know so it's it's I'm not saying this very articulately but um that it's not an easy you know one to one situation that we we meet our students needs based in keeping our services as as level I guess as we yeah. can but I, I think a good example of that Thank you. <laughs> with what Bill's talking about and how that's right. changed was looking at our service delivery the number of students at the middle school right. and in order to be in mm -hmm. compliance we had an educational assistant um, that was replaced with a teacher because we needed to be able to provide those services with a certified special educator. Thank you. That's much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to get at. <clears throat> Page seven gives you kind of a, a, well, a scattergram, obviously, of our teacher base only um, on the teacher contract. And, it, and really what it shows you is that we're now up to about almost 64% of our teachers are at top step um, 64. You know, and, and that's, 
it's not to say that some of them don't have the option to move because obviously if you're at, at top step uh, on a b36 you can go to top step on it you know masters um, mm -hmm. you can be on a masters 15 and go to a masters 30 which would get you another step so it's it's based on their education as well as it can be but if they did nothing at this point these are all as far as they can go and as far as they're going to 64 percent 64 percent um wow and you know the, the lower section of this shows you how those that that base works as far as um you know where they have been how many years they've been with us now this is only how many years they've been in our district so okay. there is the potential that somebody has been in our district for 10 years but worked five years someplace else. else we don't have that within our database that way so um but what you can see is that you know the first 10 to 20 years is you know the bulk of our employees about you know 213 um, but from 21 to 30 we have 34 employees and then from 31 to uh, 40 we only have four um, so it's you know the upper the upper levels um, aren't that heavy anymore with the potentials for retirement so it's mm -hmm. you know you yes you'll get some of those obviously in that 30 to, to 40 range but uh, You'll also get some that are in the, the 21 to 30 who have just decided to, to retire early mm -hmm. um, based on whatever they got into education. What, what's the number of retirements who you look for? We're required to basically have between four and five, depending on okay. what the teacher base is. That to retires. cover the 125. To, to make up for the 125. Now, it's very, you could, if you had five science teachers go out and we had to bring in five science teachers, we would not save the 125. Absolutely. Uh, if you have five you know, gym teachers go out, you know, like we did last year, you could save it because obviously you can bring in a much uh, younger um, teacher at the lower end mm -hmm. of the scale and and still not, you know, uh, sacrifice the program at all. Right. Um, but in a lot of the really technical areas, it's, it's you're fighting for those teachers to mm -hmm. get the right teachers in the roles, and, and it's expensive to do that. Well, and, so. and it's just when you look in the areas of math and science in particular, exactly. they're, they're just right. not, the pool is not as large. More women to go into science and math. I was just thinking that. We can fix that in the future. That's exactly what I was You're working on it. Right. When is a normal time that you firm up the hard retirements? Like, they, they have until a certain... I, I, still June, June 30th? Yeah, I know. I, okay, I was, I shouldn't have asked the question I knew the answer to, but I was afraid you were going to say June 30th. I didn't know. If the year was, before last, better than we August had there. three yeah. that walked, yeah. not, yeah. didn't walk out, I don't mean that way, <laughs> but decided right at the end of the year yeah, yeah. that they, you, you know what? I am ready to retire. They just because it's a hard decision for people to make, and they decided right at the very end. Um, so, no, so you can't really. Uh, there's no heads up, is there? Really, no, yeah. not really. No, I didn't think so. We know at this point we have a couple that are in the mix right now, but that's it, it's not enough at this point. To, you know, um, and and there will be more you know potential between now and the end. Mm -hmm. But sure, um, it's again it depends on where they are, what they're you know what the differentials will be to, to how we work it out. So. Yeah. Keep our fingers crossed that, that it all works out. And the last page is, is uh, something we added last year as well, and that was what are the major housing projects that are going on in town and uh, what district they will impact. Um, so London Estates um, is the one off of Main Street near um, the Dairy Queen. Um, it is nearly complete. Uh, we do have a number of families from that within the, the school districts already. Um, and so, you know, the impact really started. Is that the is that the one that's almost opposite Stop and Shop? No, no, it's the opposite. The other, the, the, down the other further. One. Down okay, lower. thank you. Um, Lawson Farms is the one up near Route One, um, mm -hmm. the off of Main Street, uh, the the side road that is the connector to Route One. Um, that's going to be a very large uh, development housing. Is that the horse farm? That was the old horse horse farm. Um, but that's just beginning. So the reality is we probably won't see kids from that. Uh, we'll probably see a few uh, in 2019 to 20. Uh, the bigger impact will probably be 20 to 21. Um, and they are large homes, so potential for bigger families to move into those. Nadia Estates is, is pretty much complete at this point. Uh, we didn't see a very big uptick from that, which is a bunch of uh, condos, very nice, nicely done condos off Mechanic Street. Um, so we're seeing some of the impact. We'll probably see a little bit more impact, but again, it still could be families moving in with younger than school age kids at this point. We're just not seeing you seeing them hit us. Does part of them go to Borough and Park to Igo? Is that why it's for that no. one? Um, well, it initially was a um, 
Igo district that we swung over to the borough district. Okay. So. Two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Wyman Village is the um, is the one up near the Pratt School behind mm -hmm. the Pratt School. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, it's a, a condo complex, um, fairly mm. good size, but they're single family units uh, on a, uh, a smaller plot of land type of thing, and uh, they're probably about. Uh, from what I can see, about a third sold at this point. So there's still going to be more impact to the borough school um, mm -hmm. once those get fully, uh, you know, completed and housed up. So I'd say the 2019 year is still going to be a, a potential there. Okay. The what that, is Offlet Way considered? That's London Estate. That's, That's the London, London Estate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, across from uh, the Stop and Shop, the one you were talking about originally, is a mm. uh, six-unit um Two bedroom uh, in each uh, complex, which they've six just begun. Six units. Six units will be in there. They've just begun, um, so likely that's a next year and after um, thing. So mm -hmm. we're not really seeing out of all of these that are are currently in construction or, or you know complete any really major upticks. Um, but again, they have the potential because you can see how many units we're talking about in this grouping. It's it's over a hundred mm -hmm. um, housing starts. Mm -hmm. Um, that obviously could produce easily a couple hundred <coughs> students over time. The Wall Street thing is still in, in planning stage, so it's a very uh, young thing, but that's, uh, and that would be an apartment complex, but again, with, you know, 25 one bedroom, 25 two bedroom units. So um, that, again, could have some impact on us, and that would be in the IGO district as well. Ooh, so, is there any idea when that might break ground? No, I haven't really heard them get much, you know, out of planning, uh, you know, out of the planning stages at this point. So I think they're still in front of town boards on. Yeah you know, some of the stuff that they want to do there. So, um, so again, I, I think our overall pact is that, and, and the reason we do this is to obviously we want to keep our vision on what schools potentially can be affected um, by this. And also, you know, if there were something much more major than this, we'd want to be planning for it. Um, I think even if, if I were, you know, right in saying that 200 students can come out of all of these units, we could easily absorb 200 units through our district, and that's what we're not concerned about. If it was 500, you know, then I would start to say, okay, we've got to understand exactly how that's going to impact us. This will be a gradual buildup um, as uh, the influx get done won't and be as all the, at once, as the kids right. age into the school system. Well, I it'll think. be spread across grade levels. Right. And Correct. I mean, not likely to be all in no. kindergarten at the same time. And that's and that's <laughs> the yeah, ironic thing. We've seen we've that. We've got three different kindergartens. So we've seen well, that in every major development. The um, Old State Hospital, everybody was concerned about originally. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. I mean, there's exactly. uh, maybe 50 or 60 kids that are coming out of there, but they're across 12 grade yeah. levels, and they're, you know, so they're going to three different buildings. Um, it really is absorbable within us. I mean, we have had a decrease in enrollment over, uh, you know, the last 10 years. Yeah. So, you know, an uptick is not going to bother us. Uh, we, we're planning for it, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know it's eventually we're going to start to see it. So. So that's that's kind of the, the back of some of the additional detail that we started providing last year, which I think is all right. Yeah, and so, helpful. if we have any questions between we now we can always contact because our right. next school committee isn't for three weeks because of Martin Luther King Day. Right, and that's and the that, meeting that you have to vote. Um, and that that's when we have to vote on this. So either contact Mr. Eukner before then or. Be sure to bring your final questions that day. Yep. And then that Wednesday, we're asked to be at 7 at ADCOM. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. For their review yep. of this. And we actually uh, just scheduled a meeting with the, our ADCOM uh, liaisons for the... January 15th. 15th. Um, oh, so, we'll, so you're... Gen okay. We're going to do that uh, at our office. Um, 7 o'clock, I believe it is. 6.30. 6.30? Okay. Six actually. Six. Oh, it was six. Okay. Yeah. That's a Tuesday night. Yeah. And Adcom liaison. That's with our four liaisons. Good. Four, four we have very now. good liaisons. Yes, we really do. We do. Brent Ruder, yep. Michelle Raymond, Jen Frank, and Larry Uwe. That's that's excellent. So which is good, gives us the opportunity mm -hmm. to you know answer some of their questions, go through the exact same information. Um, they end up being uh, potentially our biggest allies in at the adcom because they have a little bit more information on it before the meetings even start mm -hmm. obviously 
we're willing to supply the full adcom all the information sure. but it's nice having people who take the time um, to really kind of delve into it a little bit further up front and then of course you that gives you time to share all their questions with Absolutely. us on the 30th that's right I and mean on the 28th right and if they and if they do have uh, that's the other thing that's, that's nice is if they have some questions that come back from that, that mm -hmm. it's probably gonna be the same questions that other members of their committee would have so it gives us the ability to, to kind of be prepared and, and then we so. you prepare us right. yeah. typically right. the liaison goes back to adcom after they've met and right. said okay we met with the school department and this is an overview of what we i, I know this because I you've did been this <laughs> yeah. and what you have for questions and then they may come back to you email or in person and it, it is it's a it, it's a very good process um, what the adcom does not just with the school department obviously with the school department but really with all departments it is um, it's very time consuming it is very detailed and I, I really wish everyone in town who votes at town meeting on our budget could see this process and understand how much work and how much um, thought, thought, thought and yeah. energy goes into vetting all all of the department's budget so but definitely the school budget that's for sure mm -hmm. so thank you that's wonderful excellent okay now on to our capital improvement plan CIP thank you Bill so um, typically at this meeting we, we bring out the first rendition of the CIP budget as well um, it's going to be a fairly plain vanilla year compared to what we've had in the last few years um, and really only four items um, that we're looking to uh, advance um, through to the town meeting uh, the first one um, obviously the computer hardware which we'll go into um, as you know we own our own bus system so um, we're down to only two buses this year in the cycle that we need to replace versus the three we did last year um, we own all of our own copiers throughout the district we try to get as much life out of them but usually anywhere from a million and a half on the smaller ones to uh, three million on the bigger units uh, we need to replace them and then uh, an added one this year is the uh, sewer connection at the borough which I'll go into a little bit more detail on so on our computers this this was originally a line it started back in FY 10 and it really uh, originally it was really just buying computers um, you know we didn't have a lot of other technology in the in the town we didn't have our, our um, <coughs> data centers um, switching gear wireless connections anything so over the last couple of years this really has morphed into a network um, line versus a computer line and it now has to cover a lot more um, so it has to cover the projectors that you see pretty much in every classroom that's, that are used on a daily basis um, it has to cover everything from uh, you know whether it's a printer um, or the switch gear as I said uh, switch switch gear for us is basically the wiring connections between the classrooms and and the data um, and even the internet and, and out um, you know and also all the labs that we have uh, and maintain within each school mm -hmm. um, and labs have changed so now we've got you know uh, video labs we've got you know our CAD labs we've got <sighs> You know a number of different types of opportunities that we're offering music technology yep music you know so everything has actually got a uh, an electronic you know or or it kind of uh, symbol behind it in in one way or another uh, as you know over the last couple of years we've gone heavily uh, into the um, computers on carts so that gave us the flexibility not only in the testing time but in the classroom time to be able to move from class to class and have more opportunities during the day uh, not having to be just in a lab um, may only want to use it for one period in that class and then it can move to another class um, so we've done a number of those so this this has to basically give us the resources to refresh all of that um, you know we have found that these um, the original version of the uh, projectors that were out there um, it, ironically at this point it costs more to replace the bulb than it costs to replace the the unit because the old technology was so expensive uh, now it's LED technology so it's a lot cheaper um, but you know as I said we pretty much have every single classroom in the building in the in the in the district outfitted with this type that's of equipment. incredible so you know so we're into constant changes on, on every level and 
So this has gone up a little. We went up to 190,000 last year. We're comfortable we can stay there this year. It gives us the ability to pretty much stay on a five-year recycle um, with all of our computers. I will give technology a tremendous amount of credit because they've figured out ways to stretch different um, computer lives. In some cases, it was adding more memory. Uh, in some cases, it was moving computers that didn't need to be as high volume um, or high um, processing, speed. processing speed into an area uh, if it was just doing word processing and stuff um, and then put the newer ones in the other area. So they've been able to really kind of make it so that we get the, the biggest bang for our buck because mm -hmm. the reality is when we're done with these units, um, you know, they're, they're pretty much recycling. There, there's not much left to them to, to do anything with. So, um, but we have found that this has worked very well. We, as I said, the high demand, when you think of our data centers, um, you know, there is probably close to half, uh, half a million to three quarters of a million dollars in our data center alone of equipment, um, which is not in a classroom um, that we have to continually maintain and, and stay up on. So by doing it in this cycle, the town has gotten itself into a, a, a viable way of doing it versus having to come for big tickets, you know, every three or four years. Uh, we just stay, we're, we're just constantly maintaining and, and, That's and upgrading. excellent. And that's not just on the school side now. That's the town yes, side yes. as well. Just, I mean, I know we're not yeah, talking town about side, that, but you know, I think it's a good point yeah. when we're talking about our CIP that, you know, when they sit down at the CIP meeting, it's mm -hmm. it's both sides will yes. be taking this into account. Yeah, I think both the, the town has followed the school's um, format in both the technology and facility side, and, and so their budgets mirror ours. They have a similar line item within their CIP budget um, to do technology upgrades on their side because again they made the same mistake where they did nothing for years and then all of a sudden they had to ask for a lot yeah. so we figured out a way to also get them to kind of morph into the same process of do steady constant re this repeats. This is a good copycat. Mm -hmm. Yeah and, and it will work for everybody instead we were of being the, shocked. We were the leaders in that. Yeah well uh, the town was we were fortunate the town was very supportive back in, in 2010 to start the process mm -hmm. um, and again I think it was sold based on we're not going to ask for a million dollars we're going to ask for it in chunks right. Uh, right. to keep the things going. The school bus replacements um, we run 15 full-size daily and four uh, mini buses on a daily basis. We actually have uh, 22 of the full-size uh, buses and we have six of the minis um, and that's for two reasons. First of all, um, we do have units that are that go down so obviously we need to have backups because we still have to pick the students up and the second thing is we do a <coughs> number of our own trips. So. When buses are still in rotations um, during the day, making drops or pickups, we still have buses that are going out from the high school uh, to sporting events and, and other things, so we need that, that flexibility. Um, so obviously we do, what we do here is when we're buying new buses, they become the frontline bus. An older bus that we expect, you know, will only have a couple more years of life is our backup bus. Um, and we move through the cycle that way. Uh, as I said, we've we've been pretty aggressive on uh, doing a couple of the mini buses over the last couple of years, and this last year we did one with a wheelchair lift. Um, so we're in pretty good shape on that one. So that's why we don't need it this year. Um, the buses themselves have have stayed fairly stable pricing wise. They've been in that seventy eight to eighty two thousand range, but we also added the cameras. And we've done some refining on that. Um, I think it was probably four years ago we did the first cameras on the buses. Um, and at the time we were only doing three cameras, one in the front, one in the back, one in the middle. What we have found actually is that those are great and those, those have actually helped us in, in dealing with you know some issues with on the buses. But we have now added two cameras that get us outside as well. Mm -hmm. And we've been now are able they to, outside? Well, because we're having cars that are going by those stops um, and driving right through the thing and so it's a real safety issue so we are now able to actually give pictures to the police of the car the, the license plate and whatever uh, when they just go right through and and let the police uh, at least talk to them to make sure that they understand what the laws and the rules are. And they are. do. Yeah, and they do. They definitely do. The quality good. of these pictures is pretty it's amazing. High. Oh, it it's, is amazing. It, it's very good. Yeah. And and so I think so again I think the cameras have mm -hmm. done what we wanted to we, we again we've took a, a very you know, slow step probably in the process by by doing it only when we're replacing uh, buses. But again, you're looking, you know, with as many buses as we have, at roughly you know 2,500 to 3,000 a bus 
uh, you know, we could be spending a lot if we tried to do it all in one shot. By doing it as we're replacing the buses, the old one goes out without a camera, the new one's coming in with cameras. Uh, so we're, we'll be about half our fleet at this point. We'll have cameras. Um, and and, we'll and those those forward. extra cameras get added each time we have a yeah, new and box. we've actually gone back and, and started. To, we're going to add some to the Retrofit the original, one, so we'll get those all up to the yeah. same. Uh, fortunately, the equipment we bought was fully adaptable to go up to the five camera system, so we were oh we're excellent. But um, so again, that's you know net of the trade. We obviously always trade in the vehicles because mm -hmm. we don't want to keep them. Um, so we're all, we're looking for about one hundred sixty thousand there. And again, in any of these lines, especially in the bus line, and, and if we don't spend the money because the bus bid, you know, we get a lucky year and, and either they give us a great trade in or they give us uh, a, a better price, that money just returns to the town right. in the following year. So we just make sure that we have enough to satisfy the bid, mm -hmm. um, but then return any money that, that doesn't get used. Copiers, um, we still are a highly papered um, society when it comes <laughs> to, to teaching. Um, and you know we've been running about eight million copies since I've been here um, on an annual basis. It's it's um, kind of amazing when you look at the the process on it. But we've kind of honed ourselves down. I think we're actually only really using two vendors now that that are on the state bid list that give us uh, the best pricing on the units. Uh, by buying them ourselves instead of having a three year lease, we've been able to find that we're getting usually about three and a half to four years out of the copier. So we're, we're stretching an extra. Uh, uh, minimum know. six months. Yeah, um, which is which, which is helpful um, in the overall nice. pricing and stuff. And again, um, we've also toyed with some of the bigger units, and they seem to, to get us a little bit more uh, bang for a buck on that as far as, like, you know, the, the one that's in this room here that basically can do a much higher volume and a much faster volume um, but last longer, too. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're dealing with that. But this cycle also has worked for us. Um, you know, I don't see us becoming a paperless school district um, <laughs> um, as much as we've gone away from books and, and things because we can have it on technology. The, the, there is a lot of testing, a lot of, you know, um, on the elementary side, obviously, worksheets and, and different things that we want the kids to have the opportunity to get the information um, and be able to take it home with them and, and do it so that, it, you know, it is a, a cost to the district itself. The final one is the uh, borough school. Um, what we did was, um, I think you remember, we originally had $700,000 to do the initial study for the borough school. Um, it, we thought it was going to be more than what we needed, but it was based on what the MSBA's guidelines kind of showed. Mm -hmm. We did come in significantly less, and we had uh, $85,000 that we asked town meeting to allow us to actually purchase the sewer capacity for the borough school from the town sewer department. and. Uh, they, they did give us that money. So we do own that capacity now, 1,900 mm -hmm. gallons a day. Um, so we're good there. We had also, last year at the end of the year, saved uh, about 49,000 we put away, hoping that we could actually do the connection from the building to the uh, street. Um, but when we went out to bid during the summertime, the bids were all coming in significantly higher that, than this. Um, and so basically what we're looking for is the uh, amount to make up from that 49,000 uh, to around 79,000. So that's, that's why it's a $30,000 difference. Mm -hmm. We still have an opportunity and I'm, I'm going to try working with the DPW. The biggest part of the cost from all of the contractors that we dealt with was the going from the street to our first uh, manhole, which is literally just inside the uh, driveway. And that's because of the road cut, the, you know, a lot of the issues that you're dealing with having to have, you know, mm -hmm. patrols and all the other things mm -hmm. that go along with it. Um, I do think that we could potentially work with our DPW to have that, um, you know, work out a relationship where they can do that part of it and then we could contract decrease out their the other, cost. which could decrease the overall cost. But mm -hmm. at this point, I need to have or at least know I have the resources to complete this this summer because right. the, the process basically that we've laid out is that by... November, October, November of, of 2019, we will actually start the construction of a new addition. The new addition's entire sewer capacity has to go to the new system. It can't make it to the old septic right. system, uh, number one. Number two, in order to get to this next phase with the MSBA, 
they needed to know that we were going to walk away from the sewer system or the septic <coughs> system and go to a modern sewer system yes. connection uh, to make the, the building a viable building for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. So we've had this all planned out right. We, we had hoped to be a year early on this part of it, and quite honestly, if the bids had come in, we would have been. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, at least having enough money to do it, no matter what happens um, this summer, so that uh, when we do get to the actual bid with the contractor, it's a done deal, um, and we're already ready for that next connection that's going to come down from the opposite side into the same sewer line mm -hmm. um, is crucial to us. So that's why I'm asking for the money at this point because um, as much as I hope the, the you know I, I can work something out uh, to keep it down again, it, it, as a CIP item, if we don't spend it, it goes back to town. So, uh, but I just don't have the opportunity or, or we don't have the opportunity to basically say that, well, we're going to try to get there and if we can't, we can't. No, this uh, is critical. This is critical from yeah. a timing point of view. Mm -hmm. This could really screw up everything that yeah. we've worked so hard uh, to make work. So, and the town's been behind this. I mean, th yeah. th this is the one thing that, that, you know, we will come out of being, uh, it will be one of the last buildings that the town has on the its side that actually now will have sewer capacity mm -hmm. versus a septic system mm -hmm. uh, set up. And that's basically it. So a total of 420, which is slightly less than last year's. What was last year's? What was it last year's? year, um, you know what? Well, do you know? I actually, actually, no. I give me a second. Oh, yeah. you have it. Yeah. It's there. It's was it here on, on on this document? It well, it's hidden on this document, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I missed. Maybe I just missed it. So, Joe, did you have a question? Yes, for Mr. Yukna. Go ahead. Okay. <sighs> yes, based on the on the surplus money from the feasibility study, surplus money at the end of last year, and the CIP money request, how much altogether has will the sewer project be? So what we're basically projecting is including the purchase of the capacity. Yeah. We're about one hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars in total altogether. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the the you know the interesting part of that one, Joe, is when you are connecting to a sewer line, you are are have a one-time cost, if you will, for that capacity, uh, which you then have the right to use. But obviously, you're charged mm -hmm. on an annual basis for your usage. That was that first eighty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. That next eighty thousand we're talking about is just the physical connection. Once we do that once, that there's no additional cost to that right. from that point forward. Okay. So it's a good question, Joe. Mm -hmm. So 165 grand, right? Yep. And when is the CIP meeting in March? Typically, typically March. sometime yes. in March. Yeah. So here was last oh. year's um, total request. Total was a million six hundred sixty-seven thousand. Again, right. we did have the very large track. track and bleachers yeah. portion of that, but we did have a number of other things as well: uh, the band instruments, the uh, trucks and again your your uh, secondary bus up another seventy seven thousand there. So five seventeen above the, the right. track. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Thanks, yep. Please don't ever consider retiring. <laughs> You're doing too good a job. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Now we're not going to let you, Mr. Yukner. We're going to make up our 125 that way. <laughs> <laughs> that, no. no way. I'll try to help you. All righty. <laughs> Any further questions? Nope. All right. On to our acceptance of donations, people. One of our favorite parts of our meetings. Yes. So the first donation um, was from Meditech and with Meditech being in Foxborough we were the lucky recipients last year of $10,000 from them and going forward we've now received that $10,000 again it is to be um, used for technology and technology instruction and last year's $10,000 donation went toward vernier probes and iPads, iPads. in order to um, run the software and the, pro the software from the probes in order to look at the data analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, we that actually support the cross curricular work with math and science at right. the middle school in sixth grade. And when we went and met with them, you may remember from last year when we talked about that, they were pretty excited with how we were going to use that with our students and mm -hmm. how they would benefit in the area of science and technology. So 
right before the holidays. We received notice of this $10,000 donation once again. Very generous. Mm -hmm. and Extremely generous. Yes. We already have plans for that. <laughs> ah, Allison. Nice. Um, yes, as we continue to explore the Project Lead the Way resources and materials and the ongoing expenses that will come along with that program, um, we know that this will easily be applied towards the implementation of the program. Mm -hmm. The actual grant that Dan and I are writing, we still don't have a dollar amount for that. However, we do know that the initial investment in Project Lead the Way is pretty significant. So any, any grant funding that we can have and getting technology into kids' hands is going to be pretty exciting. So we're very grateful, so grateful. Very grateful this time. Yes. Do I have a motion to accept this donation? I'll make a motion that we accept the $10,000 from Meditech. I will second. All in favor? Four is zero zero. Very exciting. And Partners in Patriotism. So we have two donations from Partners in Patriotism, and I think that we should probably talk about the one that goes towards the Project Lead the Way first. Yes. Which is? The second one. It's That's the larger uh -huh. of the two. It's $19,159. Wow. It is a very large donation. Um, as you will see once we get into the Project Lead the Way, uh, a good example is one of the units is a, um, uh, gosh, I can't, green architecture. So there are a lot of lumber supplies and things like that and tools as part of the initial cost. There's another one that we may or may not do depending on how the grant funding comes in. It's a robotics and it uses um, new robotics equipment that's greatly, greatly improved over the current robotics equipment we have. The initial investment for that module is $28,000 just for that module. So we're not sure yeah. we're gonna be able to come in high enough for that. Um, that's one where you pay for the equipment up front and then your recurring costs are very, very low. So. We, this is a, a game changer to have this support from Partners in Patriotism for us to get the most out of the Project Lead the Way. So we are, again, extremely grateful to them for not just their generosity, but their ongoing support of our schools and our programs and helping us to be, you know, we try to be at the forefront and they really support us in doing that, so. Partners in Patriotism has really um, enabled our students to do some really wonderful and exciting things that we may not have otherwise been able to provide to our students, however much we wanted to. That's right. Um, but so many different donations over the past three years, I think, they've been doing it. The, anyway, during the, the, the time that Partners in Patriotism has been in, in effect that they've been working on this. We've received so many wonderful donations in so many different capacities that have um, really, yeah, enriched the lives of our students and uh, I can't even remember how many different ways. Mm -hmm. But it really is, to your point, yeah. something that we w wouldn't have been able to do. We would have liked to, but we are right. trying to right. be fiscally, fiscally responsible, responsible right. and and financially sound and, and um, these are exciting and great opportunities, but there are some things we would have had to say no to, and it is great to be able to say yes. It is, and, we ha and we've had to hold off on this mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. So this is something that we've been really wanting to do. Um, it's not in our regular budget, and this will provide enrichment opportunities far beyond what we've been offering up to this point at the middle school and allow all students to experience a more current curriculum in computer science, engineering, and biomedical science. And we haven't had biomedical science before. Wow. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. And, and I should the men... civics piece too. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. uh, Project Lead the Way has a big civics piece. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the projects that the students are designing have real life applications. One is designing toy for special needs children. Oh, awesome. um, there's a lot of, in the, the, um, the greenhouse that they build, mm -hmm. there's a lot of great contributions they'll be making back to the community through this. So thank you for pointing that out. I should amend my statement and just say that not just partners in patriotism, though we are very, but, but Invensys uh, yes. or Schneider Electric. Yes. And I, I'm going back to the old yes. days. And, you know, we just had the wonderful Fox donation Fox. from Meditech. Meditech. Yes. Uh, we have so many uh, community cable, partners. Uh, Foxboro Cable Access. We have the Y, so many community partners who do provide our students with enriching opportunities and uh, that we, again, probably would not be able to provide 
were it not for their generosity, both with time and with their money. That's right. I also think when you look at a lot of the ways that we try to use these partners, it's mm -hmm. always in, in an area of like seed money to try to start right. something that, that we can grow. hopefully mm -hmm. take on from there. And as Allison said on this one, the upfront cost is, yeah. is pretty staggering. But if you can get past that upfront cost, it's something that can fit within our operating right. budget and maintain. So, you know, that's why I think we're, we're very thankful mm -hmm. for these community partners because you know, when you try to go into a project like this, it's it's hard to kind of have to sell yeah. it to a lot of people. If we're able to sell it to a group like this and they let us get it going, That's then right. when we actually roll it out, the community has the ability to see what you've done with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good point. It, so. yeah, that is a great point. And there's also a hidden benefit, and through the Project Lead the Way piece of the grant, teachers get training. And that training will benefit them for the Project Lead the Way program, but it will also benefit them. They're going to be energized and excited, and it will benefit them in their regular classes that they instruct. So there's a lot of benefits for this, and I know that people will be back at this table to tell you about their adventures with oh, Project Lead the Way. Wait. This is, a, this is a great program. As I told you before, we had, I had it one of the schools that I was at. So this program is outstanding, and this seed money is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinarily it's helpful. It's vital, yes. It Project Lead the Way, there's a limiting factor to that initial cost with That's Project right. Lead the Way, and it can be a, a stumbling block Correct. for people as they develop the program, and, and this has really hurtled us up and over that stumbling block. It's a block. game changer. It really is. It really is. is. Yes. It, it absolutely is. And, um, that program is, and, and that program can continue, expand too. Yeah, you know, it can, it can down it can, and up. It's it can as well. go, it can mm -hmm. go anywhere. Yes. So um, this is great seed money, and let's hope we continue because I think it, it's a game changer for what we can do in schools with kids. I it agree. really is. So thank you, Partners in Patriotism. Yes. yes. Make a motion to accept the check from Partners in Patriotism in the amount of nineteen thousand one hundred fifty-nine dollars for the Ahern Middle School project. Lead the way. I'll With second that. Gratitude. Uh, <laughs> all in favor? Four zero zero. Um, <clears throat> the second one. So the second one from um, the Partners in Patriotism is again another huge benefit for our students, but it's it's a very different one. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give a little bit more background on the um, five thousand two hundred and fifty dollars that they are donating. And this is for a project that is a project for um, high school students. It's a screening for ECGs or EKGs, most people would be a little bit more familiar with. It's the Boston ECG Project Charitable Foundation. Um, this project is something that we learned about through one of our professional development days. So back in the fall, our nurses went to um, a professional development day with nurses from all different Massachusetts schools. And it was presented there, this high school study that is for students 12 years and older. It's voluntary for parents to participate. But when you think about some of those stories that you've heard on the news, where you have a young athlete who suddenly drops on a basketball court or suddenly drops on a football field. And then they find out later that they had a pre-existing heart condition. Mm -hmm. And that many times that if it had been diagnosed or if they had any idea, it could have been mm -hmm. treated earlier. Some things such as even hypertension. So Dr. Cadigan has partnered with Harvard Medical and um, also with um, Mass General to put together a research study with, 10, with the goal of 10,000 students to be able to provide ECG, EKGs to them free of charge. And the, um, the information that comes from that to follow up personally with any of those that come out with a positive outcome. Hmm. So I'd just like to read a couple of things here about this charitable foundation and the purpose. It's to save the lives of children and adolescents by preventing sudden cardiac death and identifying occult underlying cardiac abnormalities or conditions which are often missed by the usual history and physical examination. This is done with a screening electrocardiogram and ECG. The goal of the organization, the Boston Charitable Foundation, um, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, um, is to develop an affordable model and initiate a study that ultimately may justify widespread ECG screening for all of our youth in the United States. So when you think about as children, we take our children for well visits, they have the different screenings. The goal is that this would become a normal part of children's mm -hmm. well visits in the future and that for insurance to pay for these and to have the research behind it to support why this is necessary. Mm -hmm. 
so they need 10,000 students. They've been in already a number of high schools um, and middle school seventh and eighth graders in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Allison and I met with um, Dr. Cadigan and um, the RN with the foundation to find out a lot more information about it, along with our nurses mm -hmm. here. Um, our athletic director, um, Rich Cormier, has um, uh, endorsed this as well as the high school. The MIAA actually has endorsed this mm -hmm. as well. So it is a program to be able to bring in for parents to voluntarily um, opt in if they want to have their students screened. And the results of that, if they were to come back with a positive result, Dr. Cadigan himself, who's a cardiologist, mm -hmm. reaches out to the parents with a phone call and talks with them to say, if, this was, if there was an abnormality that was there, to help facilitate, they're not going to the assume treatment, steps. but the next steps and to be able to provide that information. It's completely, um, as far as all of the data, it's not released. It's, there's all of, all of those safety mechanisms that are in place. And, if this were to go forward, it would be a game changer as far as when we think about our young um, students. And it's not just athletes, it's, mm -hmm. it's any student yeah. um, to be able to look to see if there's anything that could be um, potentially a problem later on in some things. Even with his own son, Dr. Cadigan shared the story that, and this is how it all kind of um, began. He's testified in front of the legislature in Texas and trying to look at how can we get this pushed. Um, nationwide. So this study of 10,000 students is going to be part of that project, two-year project. Now, what is the cost of that to be able to have our students in Foxborough to be able to have that um, ECG screening for free and to be able to have that follow-up? The foundation, because it's nonprofit, they do all of the fundraising themselves. Mm -hmm. Any additional fundraising that can be done that could help to be able to get more of our students to have that ECG would be huge. So Allison and I had written a grant um, for Patriots, uh, Partners in Patriotism, and they were very interested in this. And so their funding that would be a minimum 15% of our population, which, because it's about $35 for the screening, mm -hmm. um, free to parents, but they would be funding 15% um, of our students if they were to voluntarily come forward. That's awesome. So that's what this donation um, we could have for. more than 15% of and, our and students. And it would be covered as well. We could have as many students yeah. participate um, as we have in 7th to 12th grade. But right. this specific funding is earmarked to cover the 15% of our students. Right. And there was just today, this afternoon, I saw on my news feed an 8-year-old on a carnival cruise had cardiac arrest. And I oh immediately thought of this. Just going down an the stairs. 8-year-old. So. Uh, using Absolutely this for early understand. detection, and um, Dr. Cadigan had a lot of data and research on why the 12 year old and you know how the heart develops and how why that's the right time to start and all of that, which I certainly can't do any justice to here. Um, but it was it, his commitment and his passion for this and how many lives have been saved. They usually find, you know, in their sample, less than 5% incident rate, I believe, Amy, was the number. Yeah. Um, but that's but, they, but that's 5%. Yeah. I mean, those are real people in real lives that makes a difference, so. Yeah. And it takes about five minutes for a student to be screened. Mm -hmm. um, so far, out of the number of high schools they've been in recently, they've only identified five children to, to be able to follow up with. But even if it's one, mm -hmm. even, even if it's, it's one. So that information will be coming out to parents to be able to opt in if they want to have their child screened. And um, it's an awesome opportunity to be able to have, be part of a research study too, I think that can it's really exciting. make life-saving changes going forward. Well, and again, this is another very generous gift from the Partners in Patriotism and another thing that we might not otherwise be able to do or do on an extensive basis. So this is very generous and, and uh, certainly you know, shows their commitment to <coughs> our community here in Foxborough and its well-being. And, and thanks to you and your staff yeah, for absolutely. looking into this and following up mm -hmm. with it, because it, it's an incredibly powerful study, so I, I know something about it, mm. having met with the Sports Medicine Committee of the MIA. But it's a, it's a reach out to get to a high volume of students at that age group to really look at what, what the conditions are and what the false positives are, what all the information is coming in because they don't have volume on, on the EKGs yet right. and they need volume for that study to really figure it out because uh, 
Actually, I did have a student. I lost. I lost a student for that exact reason in mm -hmm. 2005. At a Saturday morning practice, we lost him, and his heart his heart was turned around, and they would have found it. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's you have to have it's 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 a great it's a great project and a great study to try to get there, uh, to add to the Harvard study and add the volume. It's it's really huge. So it's really great that you you and the nurses really jumped on board on it mm -hmm. to really be a part of it. And it's going to be very valuable when it's done. It just takes time. Yeah. Years and years and years ago, we had a Foxborough High School student who died after a. Very very hot football practice, yep. in the pre in the preschool week they came. Mm -hmm. Jay Crowley, and, he, and some of the things they talked about were even when people are in their 30s or 40s, they may not be on a field, but they start to have issues that could have been detected. diagnosed and treated, detected and treated so much uh. earlier on. So mm -hmm. it it's really um, to make the difference in how we look at well visits going forward. The impact is huge. It's Can't be. And, and the technology may be there someday to make it economically sound too, because yeah. the kids, especially athletes, get the physicals every 13 months. Right. But this isn't part of the physical. Not part of the physical. That's it's the not key. part of the physical that, at all. That's right. That's what they're. That's goal what they're is. trying yeah. to. Yeah, right. yeah. Trying that's what they're achieve. trying. They're trying to get this to a place where there's, there's econo not and just economically not just normal and normal for all to do. Right. 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 Without false readings and with, right. with yes. reasonable. Right. So it's just yeah. part of your well yeah. visit yep. checkup. Yeah. What a big deal. It's great. Yeah. Make a motion that we accept the donation in the amount of $5,250 from the Partners in Patriotism Fund to support the Boston ECG project. I'll second that. All in favor? Four zero zero. Great. With gratitude, Janet. <laughs> With much gratitude. Right. Excellent. Okay. Other matters? Um, there's so much going on. I don't even know where to start. I guess I will wish all of our teams good luck. Oh yeah. They continue on with their seasons. Everyone started on a on a really good note. All of our different teams and um, our DECA uh, students have a co big competition Tuesday and Wednesday in Mansfield. Good luck to them. And our debate team has their home debate on Wednesday here at Foxborough High School. So. Good uh -huh. luck to the debate team. Has National Honor Society held its induction yet? It's on the 15th. F January 15th. January 15th. At, six. at Do we know the time? It's either Actually, 6 or 6.30. 6 it's on the sign, actually, out front. So. Just can't remember if it's 6 or 6.30. Jan 15th. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, That's what I have. Thank you. Rich? I think thank you. Chris? No, we're almost up. Any more, Mamie? Um, just a couple of things. I'll pass this around. This is going to be sent out to oh, all yeah, parents. I saw that on the internet. Um, so this is the dangers of vaping. It's a parent presentation that we're going to have here at the high school on right. February the sixth. It's the I've been working with the board of health with um, Pauline Zagdal. Is that how you pronounce her last name? You know, I I always mispronounce that. I'm sorry, Pauline. But Pauline and I have been going back and forth and along with all of the administrators to find a date with our very busy calendar of all of the things that mm -hmm. we're mentioning. But this is an information um, for parent information night for parents. It's 45 minutes to an hour long. It's going to take place at 6.30 on February 6th in the high school auditorium. And it is really um, going to hopefully reach a lot of parents on vape pens, e-cigarettes, and the nicotine addiction, and what we should know as parents, what we should be looking for, because it is an epidemic across the country. Yeah, I, um, I plan to be there. Do you know if it will be um, taped for cable or to be... Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I can check in to yeah. that as far as um, if they're <clears throat> if they're willing to be. We always have to ask the right. presenters. I, yeah, I know, I know that's always a, can be a sticking point. But, with, but if it if with it, Foxborough Cable, even yeah. So I will check in. It would that. be great See if they're if, willing to be. We could do that just to have it available. I mean, I know we want to get maximum presence in the auditorium, absolutely. But I, I know how busy everybody is, and it would be good if we have this wonderful presentation that we could then refer people to Absolutely as agree. well as they were looking for more information down the road and missed the presentation. Yeah, but I know idea. we'll see what happens. But thank you for organizing this and thank you to Pauline. Yes. And the only other um, 
thing that I wanted to mention was this makes one year mm -hmm. as far as myself <laughs> in the superintendent role and Allison and the assistant superintendent role. And well, we should have had a party. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> ladies. I started thinking about that as, um, you know, coming over this evening that it's already been a year because starting this time last year was a new mm -hmm. year, but right. also new roles for us. Right. And it has been... And Debbie was no longer here. It has been a rewarding year. And the support of our teachers and our administrators and the community really has been wonderful. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and to our community for their continued support because it really is a school system of excellence. We have fantastic kids and staff, and there's no place that I know I would rather be as far as to be able to make an impact on the lives of children. I'll second that, for sure. Went by fast. It did indeed. Mm -hmm. It's been a good year. Well, happy anniversary. <laughs> and thank, you. thank you. And <laughs> good luck in your second year. We are behind yeah. you, ladies. Thank, thank you. you for all you do. Thank you. And do you have anything extra? Um, only that we have our Professional Development Day coming up on January 25th. And um, as our continued work comes from our uh, committee work that we did last year on our policies for bias and discrimination and building cultural proficiency, we have Dr. Kalise Warnham once again coming for the entire K through 12 staff. And everyone is very excited about continuing to learn from here because we are really committed to building our skills and cultural proficiency. So excited about that. I like that. Cultural proficiency. Yes. Oh, our new web presence. Would you like to say anything about that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How did I forget that? <laughs> I so, forgot it too. <laughs> so hopefully many have experienced the new web presence. It has been long in the making. We ran into some, um, some glitches with design in the fall, and it took a little bit longer than what we had hoped, and that was on the design side. They changed our design team a couple of times. But it has been fully launched. We are in the process of learning what is working well with it, where are things that we need to adjust. People are still trying to find information that maybe was in a location on the website before that they don't see on the current website. So any feedback is, is welcomed. Mr. Heyer um, will join us at the next school committee meeting and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about it at that point. Great. Great. And the other thing that I will just mention is that as part of having that web presence, we will be able to do automated phone calls for students that are absent. Mm -hmm. That will be coming out soon. So if your child is absent, you would receive an automated phone call for you to call and confirm back. That will allow us to get them out faster, mm -hmm. actually, than having to call individuals one at a time. Oh, yeah. I, I only had a chance to briefly kind of take a gander through the new web presence, and, and, uh, and I think it looks great. I, yes. I really do. I need to do a deeper dive <laughs> into it. It'll probably never be the same place twice because there's a lot of up, you know, up to date things yeah. always changing. But that it means really has a good look about yeah. it. I can't wait until Aaron comes and gives and us. And the, the biggest piece really is going back to where we've seen from the data people are using devices to yeah. access the website so much more. So that's where you see that it's much more responsive no matter what kind of device mm -hmm. that you're on. That's good. That's great. Excellent. I'm so excited that our high school musical was actually on our stage, and there were, have been many comments um, at the Orpheum also, but I wanted to let people know that the elementary presentations there have gone very, very well. It has supported the Orpheum. We just had the first year gala of its reopening. There were 300 different levels of entertainment over this past year and 24,000 people attended them as spectators. That's wow. not counting the people who were in the building for maintenance or rehearsals or vendors or anything else. Yeah, it's great but to for see what, it. Yeah, Revitalized. so we live, I know, the town is supportive of mm -hmm. the arts in, um, you know, in our schools, but it's, I think, us bringing back the musicals to the high school is a very good time to do it right now. Green's That's very all exciting. very exciting. Right. I think the next elementary school musical is Willy Wonka. Oh, yeah. boy. My, my third grade CCD class was all a buzz about it. Too. Oh, well, <laughs> they were very good. And the chocolate factory, that's great. Uh, anybody ready to suggest that we go home? A movie adjourned. I'll second. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. <clears throat>